I don't know how else to put it, but there were people back in the late 80s, early 90s, there were people who loved Jeff Bodon, and there were people who loved to boo Jeff Bodon once upon a time. Um, I, I personally think the boo Bodine sign was kind of a trickle-down effect of that. Um, what kinds of reactions did you get from fans, basically just because you were Jeff Bodine's brother? That's funny you ask that. I I never – the trickle-down theory didn't really happen. Really? And I think that because because Brett was in between us. Brett, okay. Brett yeah. got a lot of yeah. the trickle down. Okay. And absolutely not deserving of it. Because yeah. it's like I said earlier, Brett was the guy everybody loved. And even at a racetrack, I mean, he didn't rough anybody up. Once in a great while, maybe, you yeah. know, but he was a calculating smart driver. So I think a lot of that trickle down kind of went through with Brett. And then I come along and I really didn't ever see it and feel it did you and not? the one thing that that's the one thing that i always did get doing autograph sessions and things like that from fans as the comment i never did like your brother but i like watching you race <laughs> it's like okay how do you answer that <laughs> thank you <laughs> I, don't know. I never did so well I, I appreciate that you know yeah. you know but it's uh it was it was so there was times it was tough you know the one place that i did get it unequivocally, was Oxford 250 in Oxford, Maine. Really? So we go up there. I would have it's thought another, that was on turf. It's another, <laughs> another funny story. Now, what you got to remember, Jeff went up there with Amanda Savakis in a white tornado car and, and kicked butt. I mean, I won like four of them, I think, or something, 250s. So n- nobody likes a winner, right? So we go up there. It's a funny story. Kyle's going to drive the car. It was the Ames car. And Jerry Kennan, the crew chief, and John Monson and myself, we're getting through inspection. We're pushing the car. And I looked at Jerry. I said, this is like an hour before practice in, in Maine. And I'm like, Jerry, where's Kyle at? Jerry said, I don't know. He's supposed to be here. I said, well, you better call somebody and find out where he's at. So this is way before cell phones. So Jerry calls down here to Sabco, right over here in the park, Lakeside Park. Says, hey. Is Kyle there? Yeah, hang on. Let me get him for you. <laughs> now, Kyle's supposed to practice in Oxford, Maine in an hour, <laughs> yeah. and he's down here in North Carolina. Jerry gets, Kyle, where are you? We're practicing in an hour. He says, oh, man, I ain't going to make it. <laughs> well, obviously, <laughs> you're, you're not going to make it. He said, just, just put Todd in the car. It'll be all right. Don't worry about it. Just put Todd in the car. So Jerry calls up Ted Connors. says, what do I do? He, Ted says, Put Todd in the car because Kyle's not going to be there. That's for sure. So now here I am. I'm going to race the Oxford 250. Now it kind of sounds funny. Is Kyle six five, whatever he is, and I'm five eight? How am I going to fit in? Well, believe it or not, if I put a, like this much cushion below my lower back, I fit perfect because Kyle sat with his legs so bent. So that wasn't an issue. So we go out, go out and practice, and we do well. We qualified in the top ten. And back then, for the 250, they used to have, it was sponsored by, you know, it was a Bush Series. And the race actually was sponsored by Bud Light, I think. And they took the beer cans, and they had 10 of them, and they wrote the numbers, 1 through 10, on the bottom of the beer can. And they set them all out on the start-finish line, and the top 10 guys would go out. It was almost like a pill draw. You go out, and you pick the can up, and wherever your number was, where you started, it was a beer draw. So I'm like in the middle of the pack to, to pick, and they just saying, from Shemong, New York, Todd Bodine. And you thought that, I mean, I just shot the, there he is, I shot the president or the pope or something. <laughs> the grandstands just booed like there was, no, this is my first time I was ever in front of these people. <laughs> and they're booing the hell out of me. Like, well, thanks a lot, Jeff. Appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, so that was – so I did I did get a little of the boo. But it was really cool. That race, we went on, and we ran really well. We were leading with 30 laps to go, and it started sprinkling. And we only had two tires left to put on. Everybody else had four. 
Caution comes out. They drive the track. We all pit. I put my two on. Ricky Craven and Bobby Labonte were behind me. They put four on. We take off, and I held Ricky off for a little bit, and he got the lead. And then Bobby coming, and he, he passed me, and I ended up finishing, I think I was third or fourth in the race. But, uh, yeah, it was funny. That was Ricky Craven won the first. That was his first 250. Wow. You did win races that year in 92 at Nazareth and Michigan and Bristol. Was that your breakout year? Um, Is that what put you on the map, so to speak? I think so. Um, that first year with Hungry Jack as a sponsor, um, we had Hutter Motors. We had uh, really good bodies. Uh, Bruno Hosel was putting the bodies on, doing a great job. Charlie, we we had everything. We had a good pit crew. Clyde McLeod, the crew chief, did a great job. I mean, we just had it all, and we. We were the guy that everybody looked to every week in practice and timed that guy, okay, how fast do we got to be to beat him? And that was pretty neat, to, to be that guy. Uh, we did that in, in 92 and 93. And, you know, halfway through 93, uh, I got the offer from Butch Mock to go cup racing. Yeah. And hindsight 2020, I probably shouldn't have. Um. But when you're young and, and aspiring and that's what you want to do and you want, you want to be part of the show, uh, you know, I took the job. I took the ride. And Butch was a good guy. And we, there again, we, the first year, 94 in Cup, man, we ran really well. I mean, we had the opportunity to win a couple of races and had things go wrong. A couple of oil lines broke and different things. So, but, yeah, I think 92 probably was the year that really turned things for me. 92, you also ran your first cup race at Watkins Glen. Mm -hmm. Had you ever raced against Jeff and Brett before? No. I'd never raced against Jeff. Okay. And I had raced with Brett maybe three times before that. Okay. Yeah. In Bush or? In the Modifieds okay. yeah. in New England. Yeah. Um, you know, because when I started racing the Modifieds up there, Brett had already moved down. Uh, quick story, the very first time I ever raced against Brett was Riverside Park, a little quarter-mile track, and we had to run the heat races, and I was Brett was next to last, and I was last. And Brett told me before, he said, now look, when we all go off into one, we're all going to stop. So whatever you do, don't run into me. I said, okay, no problem. Now, <laughs> I'm scared to death, right? I've never raced a modified, and it was probably only my sixth or seventh race ever. So we go out in the heat race. We go off, we take the green, we go off into one. Guess what I did? Wham! Pile <laughs> drove Brett in the back, bent the bumper up to the fuel cell. I mean, I'm, it was funny. And yeah, so that was a quick story, but yeah. What so, yeah, I never raced against him. And one thing that was a little disappointing about that race at Watkins Glen, you know, being at home, um, Scott Welliver, Frank Cece were listed as the car owner. We had 34 as a number, uh, the racetrack had procured Diet Pepsi to sponsor us so that the three Bodines could race together for the first time, all three of them, at home at Watkins Glen. And the one thing that's really disappointing, Junie Dunleavy was actually the owner of the car. It was Junie's car, Junie's team, and we just did the number thing and this, just so we could have that synergy around our, our other team. And so when it came out to list the drivers that had driven for Junie Dunlavey when he had passed away, You're I right. wasn't on the list. Wow. And that 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 was I really did not know that. that really kind of got me at that point yeah. cuz yeah. man, what Junie was such a cool guy, such a nice guy and you know, I I remember four or five times I drove from here to Richmond to go sit in the seat or I went up there a couple times just to spend a day with the guys at the shop and with Junie and just got to know him, and just a really cool guy, nice guy. And when that all happened, I didn't get listed as a driver. Do you have any particular memories of, of seeing Brett or Jeff on the track? Did you get a chance to actually race them? Uh, no, I, I don't I don't think I ever got really around them. Of course, Jeff was up front. He always was up front at Watkins Glen. Brett wasn't far behind him. You know, he was racing for uh, – Bernstein, yeah. 
in the 26 car, this one right over here. Yeah. Um, and I was I was in the back, and we we actually were doing okay. You know, I was probably around 20th or something, 23rd right in there, and uh, the alternator ended up going bad, so we didn't get to finish the race. You mentioned going to drive for Butch uh, in 93, and you you said looking back on it, you might not ought to have done it. Was that just because of the Bush championship or? No, I I, I feel like, and, and, I, I give, and I give this advice today to these young kids. Of course, they don't listen to me. Um, but... Just don't don't jump ship too early. You know, make sure that you're ready for the move. Uh, conquer what you what you're in. Win races with what you're in, whether it be in the trucks or Xfinity or lay mile stock car. Doesn't matter. Be the best you can be in that before you move up. You have done that though. Well, to a certain degree, yeah, I did. But the problem was my third year in the Bush Series was really my only my third year period of racing. Okay. I mean, when I started 91 full-time in the Bush Series, I had like 42 starts in my life. I didn't, I didn't really in know how to. In any kind of. In anything. You know, people don't realize that. You know, okay. my, my fourth year of being, a, of being a racer, a driver, I was in the Cup Series against the best in the country. And, you know, looking back, I probably should have stayed in the Bush Series another year, got some more experience, and understood it because I was still making mistakes in 1993 racing in the Bush Series because I could go fast, I could win races, but I laid, made a lot of mistakes and was too aggressive in, in, in times where I didn't need to be, and I didn't understand that. You know, I didn't, I didn't have a good driver's knowledge of how to race and it and it cost me a lot of wins a lot of wins and when i moved up to cup i carried that with me and i learned to race in cup but i made a lot of mistakes and i wrecked a lot of cars i was fast i mean we were really fast and and i i carried that through my career until when i got to the truck series full time with jermaine now I'm an, a veteran with a lot of experience, and I understand what it means to get to the end of the race and how to race the races, and I really believe that was one reason I was so good in the truck series because I, I finally understood what, how it meant to be a racer, what it meant to be a racer, and how to get to the end of the race. What was Frank and uh, Scott's reaction to you doing the cup deal with Butch? Were they okay with it, or well, were you maybe <laughs> planning to do something together? Well, you know, we're always planning to keep going. You know, I remember Fr Frank wasn't happy, that's for sure. Scott wasn't happy either, but they both understood. You know, they they knew that, you know, who I was, what my name was, how good we had done, I was going to eventually get called up to the show. And I think they were just disappointed that we didn't have a couple more years together to win that Bush championship, win some more races. And like I said, looking back, I probably should have done just that. So, 94 is your first full-time year in Cup. Um, you go to the inaugural Brickyard 400, and you finish ninth, and that was a pretty decent finish for you and the team. However. 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 <laughs> nobody remembers that part of it. That's for sure. Um, Jeff and Brett. <coughs> Jeff and Brett. Did you see anything taking place between the two of them in real time? And what was your reaction in the car once you found out? Um, I didn't see anything. All I knew was I came around and Jeff was there wrecked. Did you know? No. Nope. Okay. All right. Did not know. Did you find out in the car or? 
Um, you know, I think I think Butch might have told me that, you know, hey, Brett just wrecked Jeff, so be ready for it or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And what really, <laughs> I mean, we all know what happened after that. And but what was really bad for us is we actually, and I, and I say this, and I'm not kidding. We actually had the fastest car there. Um, we were Jeff Gordon won the race, and we were we were running faster than him. We had a 35 second green flag stop, mm. and it was at the end of the race. And I remember <clears throat> we were we were Gordon would be coming off on one straightaway, and we'd be at the other straightaway going in the corner. So we were at one end of the corner. One end of the racetrack away from them. And after the stops, we were less than one end of the straightaway in front of them from going a lap down. So we lost track time, positions. I mean, we went back to, like, 23rd. What happened? Do you- I don't remember. It was just a bad pit stop. I don't know if gun broke or something. I don't remember. So we just pitted, <laughs> and they gave me a full drink bottle of orange Gatorade and it was the kind with the hose because you know you have to have the hoses stick up under there and I had a drink holder to hold it it was a green flag stop so I didn't get to drink on it yet and I was mad oh I was so mad and I go down to getting going down the back straightaway and I'm like the hell with it if I get caught I get caught if I don't good deal so I picked that drink bottle up out the window it went. <laughs> I go through the end of the corner. Caution comes out. Todd. I'm like, yes, <laughs> it worked. And I come back around, and that drink bottle was laying halfway up the racetrack, perpendicular, so it didn't roll down to the bottom or nothing. It was just laying up there perfect, just full of orange Gatorade. And I'm like, yes. So now we'd all just pitted. Yeah. So we didn't. Nobody pitted for tires, and there was we all could make it on fuel. There was probably thirty some laps left. You know, it was going a little longer run, but it wasn't a long run. So we restarted like twenty third, and we were so fast. I mean, we just passed, just catch somebody, pass them, and go on. We drove to ninth. There was no caution the rest of the race, and we drove up to finish ninth. And the thing was so fast. And so, but nobody knows that. And that's the first time I've ever told that drink bottle story to to anybody that wants to listen. Let's see. And then in the next race, um, the next race in the driver's meeting, they chewed us all out. The next time we find debris on the racetrack that came out of somebody's race car, you're getting black flagged and put to the garage area. (laughs) Okay. So did anybody know that it was yours? No, there was no writing on it. It was Clear bottle. Oh, okay. Nobody knew yeah, it was ours. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, okay. You telling that story brings up another question. Brett finished second. Yep. If you click off a what, fifteen second pit stop, yeah. Instead of a thirty second pit stop. So it could have been how, you and Brett racing. How things would have been different. Hello. Now that would have been a story. That would have been something. That would have been something. But I'll be honest, I don't think it would have been much of a race because our car was just that fast. It was just ridiculous. Everybody get to the to the even numbered corners. So you got one, two, three, four, Indy. You know, two and four is what leads to the straightaways. And they'd get to two or four and they'd all have to roll up a little bit in the throttle and then get back to it. I'd go just I mean, and then there was times I wouldn't even lift. That was how good the car was turning. And all I had to do was stay back away from them, enter in the corner, and I'd just pull up a little draft, pull out and pass them down the straightaway, pull in front of them and go to the next one. It was so much fun. Well, Brad had already gotten he'd already gotten into it with one brother. Yeah. What would another have mattered? Uh, he, I'd have <laughs> passed him and he wouldn't have been able to keep up. That's that's what would have happened. Oh, now there is an alternate history. Now report. to go Holy to race cow. Gordon down and pass him, well, that would have <laughs> that would have been something to do. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, it, it would have been, and you know, 
how would my career have been different if I had won that race? Is that something you think about? I've, I've had several moments where I think about those things. Really? You know, what if, just what if one thing was different and I could have won a cup race? That, and that is that is one of my disappointments yeah. uh, in racing. Uh, I never won a points cup race. I won two Winston Opens at Charlotte. Yeah, yeah. But I never won a points race, and that that is disappointing to me because I, I really feel like I could have and I should have a few times. So everything did happen with Brett and Jeff. What? And I don't want to get too personal or anything like that, but what were those next few days and weeks and months like in Clan Bodon? It was hard. Man, it was really, really difficult. Um, of course, I'm stuck right in the middle. And, you know, I'd, I'd heard some phone calls between them that were really pretty ugly. And unfortunately, it took our father getting sick and passing away for those two to yeah. make amends and realize that life is way too short for this kind of crap and we need we need to straighten our act out and they did and you know forgave each other and you know still love each other like brothers you did wind up back in the bush series in 96 um was that a disappointment or were you content to still be racing at that point uh it's always a disappointment when you <clears throat> are a, in my terms, a failure in what you attempted to do and being to run the Cup Series and get fired. Um, and it's, this particular one was really bad because at the end of 94, it would when I was with the 75 and Butch, um, I was offered three top rides in in the cup series and I turned them all down because I promised Butch Mock that I would stick with him. We were, he gave me the chance and we would build this team and become winners together. And I stuck to my word and at the end of the next season, he fired me. So that was, that was a really rough time for me. And when I was fired, I didn't have any ride lined up. I had nothing going on. And Ron Neal, who was a very successful engine builder, wanted to start a team, had no money, had nothing. And we went over there, uh, myself and one of my best friends that I had brought from Pennsylvania as a worker, John Fabian, he came over and crew chiefed, and we had we had three race cars, and we had enough parts for one. So we'd race one one week, we'd take the suspension off it, maintenance it, put it on the other car, and race the other car. We had like two motors, and Ron just kept rotating the motors. And we ended up that year, we finished third in points. We won a race. And we spent six hundred thousand dollars when the rest of the teams were spending about one point four million. And it was so bad. We went to Loudon and got there and Goodyear wouldn't sell us any tires because Ron had not paid the tire bill from the week before because we were on a pay as you go basis. Yeah. So I had to stroke a check that week out of my own personal account to buy the tires. Wow. Yeah, it was that bad. And but good people and hard work, we did well. Finished third in points and won a race. Nothing to sneeze at. And you did at the end of the year. Did that team just fold, or because you wound up with, um, back with Frank in '97? Yeah, they. I think they ran a few races the next year, but it was again no yeah. money and people not to work. People weren't going to do what we did the year before. I mean, we worked day and night on that thing, and especially John and a couple of our guys that worked there just just worked like dogs on it. 
you're going to find people to do that. So they, they ran a few races and, and uh, ended up quitting. Uh, John had came with me back to C.C. Welliver. Uh, so, yeah. It was... okay. Texas, early in 97, uh, Ricky, Ricky Craven was injured pretty badly during practice. And you not only sub for him, but you're leading – Barely late in the race. 30 laps to go. Um, first of all, how did you wind up in the car? Uh, well, when he got hurt, um, Jimmy Johnson, not the racer, yeah, the other Jimmy Johnson who was Rick's, basically his GM at the time, great guy, loved Jimmy. Um, he come over to the Bush garage and said, look, Ricky can't race. He's hurt. We need some way to drive this thing off. We'll just do the best we can, you know, and put you in the backup car and do the best we can. And so I went over and I got a little bit of practice in it and qualified in the middle of the pack. I think I got like, I don't know, a little bit of practice. <clears throat> and uh, started a race, and it was one of the first races on the racetrack when the corners were all screwed up. And I figured out before everybody else, I don't know if anybody else figured it out in that race, figured out how to drive the track and make speed. And we went right to the front. I mean, this thing was fast. The can Andy Graves was the crew chief at the time. The car was fast. And we went to the front, and 30 laps to go. We were leading. And I was always a little free right after restarts, and it was only four or five laps after the restart. And Jeff Burton come up from behind and just got right on my bumper, I don't know if he hit me or not coming off a of two, but it felt like he did. I don't know. Maybe it was just air or whatever. And around I went, spun out and hit the inside wall. Um, that's another one of those moments. What if? What if I just let him go and a few laps, my car would tighten up, and I went back by him and ended up winning that race? What if I was smarter? How would my career have been different? So that wasn't anything you necessarily held against Jeff or anything. No, absolutely uh, okay. not. I don't. You know, at the time I said he ran into me, and if you watch replays of it today, it's close. Yeah, yeah. I, you really can't tell. There's, there's one. I, I actually watched it on YouTube yesterday. There's <laughs> one view where okay, Todd just got loose. There's mm-hmm. no, not it was Jeff was nowhere near. But then there's another view. Yeah, I think maybe he did. Uh, you know, it, it was very yeah. Mm-hmm. It was like a bang bang play in baseball. Yeah, even if he did hit me, it wasn't anything on purpose. You know, and and I'm I'm a realist. You know, if I know the guy didn't do it on purpose, I'm not going to be mad at him. I just I've been around the sport too long to to be that way. Well, see, I'm trying my best to connect it back to Bristol and this being a <laughs> long running, you know, kind of thing. You know, I'm looking to make a story here, Tom. Yeah, no. Now, you're a journalist that now. Bristol, that you know Bristol's what that's Bristol's like. in the rearview mirror. <laughs> we don't even think about that one. Yeah. All right. Um, 1998, the whole Tabasco fiasco thing. I don't even know where to – what went wrong? Um, crooked car owners. Okay. Is, this is the bottom line. Um, what could have, what could have been the best deal in the sport turned out to be a joke, a, a, the, literally a joke, the Tabasco fiasco, uh, Tabasco, great, great people, great family. And it's family. It's still family today. Um, you know, and they, these owners had talked them into coming to racing and they came to me as the driver, and I said yes. It was the largest sponsorship in the sport at the time. The problem was they were the two owners were were from IRL. Uh, they they liked Indy cars, so the got the spot. And I find all this out so, couple, several years later. They they got six million dollars. Uh, they took. A million dollars right off the top and bought a jet airplane. Then they took, so now we're down to $5 million. 
They took $2 million and gave it to their IRL team to race the IRL series. So now we got $3 million to run a cup team on against teams that are spending $5.5 million. $5 million is $5.5 million. And we got three. How in the hell are you going to be competitive? Yeah. You can't be. They bought a bunch of junk cars from Jack Rouse, uh, the Pontiacs that Chad Little had raced before, and Chad struggled with them. I mean, what do they, what do they think we're going to do with them when Chad can't drive them? And Mark Smith was doing the motors, and his his hands were handcuffed. He had very few good parts, a bunch of junk motors, and we had one good car and one good motor, and we put them together for the first race at Atlanta on the repave when Jeff was on the pole at over 200 mile an hour, and we qualified third. I think we finished eighth. I mean, we had a good run. So we had a good team. We just didn't have the pieces to do it because the owners spent all the damn money on other stuff. Now, were you aware of this at the time, or is this after the fact basis? had an understanding that that's probably what happened after talking to Pat Trayson was the crew chief, after talking to Pat and finding out how handcuffed he was on what he could buy and what he could do, and talking to Mark Smith and finding out how handcuffed he was, yeah. it's like, okay, where is all the money at? And all of a sudden they have this diamond jet that they're flying around in. It's like, and they have an IRL team that says Tabasco on it, and Tabasco didn't sponsor the car. So you kind of put two and two together and say, okay, they've they've spent all the money. Was it a relief when you left? See ya. Uh, it kind of. <laughs> a relief, but disappointing. Oh, yeah. And it was disappointing because Tabasco, you know, they let me go about halfway through the year. And Tabasco had already spent $3 million on marketing me. And... The, the CEO of Tabasco, he came to Charlotte for the, for the 600 and didn't have anything Tabasco on, just him. And he walked around the garage area, and I had several owners and crew chiefs tell me the same exact story, so I know it happened. And he went to, to car owners and crew chiefs and other drivers and asked them all, you know, told them who he was and said, look, can, what's wrong with my team? And every one of them told him it wasn't the driver, that they need to look at the owners. So that next week, Tabasco found out on Twitter that I was fired. They never even called the, the sponsor to tell them they were changing drivers. So, yeah, it was a bad deal. But it was a relief to not have to get in that chip box and try to make something happen we we missed like i don't know we tried to run 12 12 or 14 races somewhere in there and we missed half of them yeah didn't even make the races yeah it was that bad things didn't work out the cup level but again you were able to land on your feet back with frank and scott mm-hmm was that was that home to you? Were were they? I don't want to say your safety net, but the relationship had to be really, really good for that to happen. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, as soon as it went down, um, they called said, "Look, we need to make a change in one of our cars. We have to do it. Yeah. You want to come drive it?" And that was the thirty Slim Jim car. Um, and it just so happened at that time, Brett's brother-in-law, Donnie Richardson, was the crew chief. So there was a lot, of, a lot of synergy around that whole thing. And I went over there, and we ran good. Um, we didn't win a race that year, but we ran up front the whole time. The next year, we went over to Phillips 66 and contended for the championship, won a couple of races. Yeah, so it was to go back to C.C. Welliver, yeah, it was like home. And it never, even though I raced other places, it never felt like it wasn't home. I mean, I could go over a shop, walk in there, and it was like I'd never left. Um, and that was partly because I helped build it to what it was. And and Frank and Scott knew it, and uh, Clyde McLeod was still there. Clyde was still there as a general manager. 
and you know we all were family and it's and it's so it was always that way 